Hello. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here with us in Science Gallery Dublin. My name is Dr. Maureen Hurley. I'm the Education and Learning Manager here. So I'm delighted to welcome you all to this event. It's the second in our series of events along with, in partnership with ICON. And we're really excited about this event series. It'll be running over the next three years with 15 events in total. And it's all about living with. So living with, looking at the human experience of living with major disease, looking at the future of uh, drug development and medical device innovation and diagnostic techniques. Um, ICON have been a supporter of Science Gallery Dublin since the very beginning here, back in 2008. So like us, they've grown internationally, but possibly on a slightly more exponential trajectory. So they're now in 38 countries worldwide with 13,000 employees. Not quite as many science galleries just yet, but watch this space. Um, so they're world leaders, global leaders in drug development and medical device innovation. And we're really excited about this partnership that we have with them. Tonight's event focuses on the big C, cancer. So guiding and moderating this discussion is the wonderful Dr. Kira Kelly, GP, broadcaster and journalist. And we're delighted to have her here again with us to guide and uh, facilitate this discussion with our wonderful panelists. I'll hand over to Kira in a moment and she can lead the introductions of everybody. Uh, but just to let you know that we will have time at the end of the event for questions and answers from the audience. And also after the event, we will have a book signing from one of our panelists, Sinead Gleeson. Uh, Sinead's struggling a bit with a uh, lost voice this week, so she's probably not going to be getting into very deep and meaningful chats during, but she's still willing to stay and do a quick book signing, so we're very appreciative of that. That'll be held in the Science Gallery shop, which is on the ground floor opposite the cafe after the event. So just a couple of important notices. We'd be delighted for you to use your phone and to share this event on social media, but just make sure your phone is on silent and that you're not taking any photographs with flash. If you want to follow Science Gallery or ICON, the Twitter handles are at the bottom of the slide here. Um, we will be streaming live on Facebook and Periscope as well. Um, and then finally, just take a moment to notice your fire exits. So there's one over here on the right hand side of the stage and the two doors at the back of the auditorium. Um, so finally, thanks to our panelists, thanks to our partners ICON and to all of you for being here. Um, we are very much looking forward to this event, obviously, and to the following events in the series. So with that, I'll hand over to Dr. Kira Kelly. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, I'm delighted to be here at the Science Gallery talking today and this evening about living with cancer. And obviously we're going to take it from a, a scientific point of view. We are in the Science Gallery, but equally we want to look very closely at, I suppose, the patient experience of, of living with cancer and their journey through it. I, there's a bit of feedback on my mic, I think. Um, but I'm delighted you're, you're all here and I'm going to introduce the panel. Obviously cancer is probably the thing that will kill most people in Ireland today. Uh, the rates of cancer, because of uh, largely lifestyle issues, appear to be climbing, yet we are still fighting the good fight against it in terms of advances in diagnostics and in treatments and in terms of outcomes. Um, and obviously we would be delighted to have your questions. Uh, and each of our panelists are here for a specific reason, because they all have an individual uh, role to play on this panel. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. First of all, Martin, if you want to tell everyone why you are here this evening. I'll do my best. I, I should say I was just telling folks over here, I had another colleague who's introduced himself and took 45 minutes over it. I promise you I won't do that. Um, so uh, I've been working with Icon Clinical Research for about seven years now. I've had about 27 years on and off in, can in cancer clinical trial research, etc. As you can tell from my accent, I'm not from around here. I'm actually from uh, England. I live in London. Uh, but I head up the Icon Oncology Project Management Group. So our responsibility globally is actually to run clinical trials in the cancer and the oncology and cell therapeutic space. Um, and for me, that's a massively exciting thing given the developments. It's also quite onerous in some ways um, from a, you know, the responsibility that, that we carry. So I'll stop talking now because I want to give the opportunity for my others, but uh, I hope I can uh, shine some light on uh, cancer development and some of the science behind it later. So that's Dr. Martin Lack and, and Cleena, would you like to tell people why you're here this evening? I'm Cleena Fairley, Professor of Comparative Immunology here I'm a, in Trinity. I'm a scientist, and but worked for many years in St. Vincent's University Hospital, which is the National Liver Transplant Centre. 
And in the early uh, in the 90s, we were amongst the first in the world to show that the liver is full of immune cells. And the types of immune cells that are in the liver are really potent anti-tumor cells. And I came home to my husband, who's a surgeon, very excited with these discoveries. And he said to me most disdainfully, you have not seen the size of the tumors I take out of people. There is no way the immune system is going to be able to deal with those. <laughs> he is gracious enough to say <laughs> <laughs> that he is delighted to discover that he is wrong. And, but we have oceans more to discover, and that's why I'm here. Thank you. Uh, and <laughs> I love that you, I hope you lord that over him uh, today uh, on that basis. This is Owen. Owen, would you like to say why you're here this evening? Sure. Um, I'm here, I guess, to offer uh, my views as a patient. I'm living with cancer at the moment, um, have been for a few years. I grew up in Dublin, but I, I live in, in London for the last six or seven years. So all my treatment has been over, over there on the NHS, which is phenomenal. Um, but uh, yeah, just that's my, my outlook, I suppose, from the, the, what, what it's like to, to live through it, the diagnosis and the treatment and the getting on with day-to-day -day life. I know you, you, you have a brain tumour. Oh, yeah. Uh, what, 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 <laughs> what, just what age were you diagnosed at? Uh, 32 or 3. So, so very, uh, very Three young. or four years yeah, ago. very young. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, yeah, yeah early 30s. Uh, it's, it's called a, a well, GBM4. Um, I don't know if that means anything to you, you young scientists. A glioblastoma multiform, and the 4 uh, is grade four, so the, the World Health Organization grade tumors from one to four, four being the most aggressive, so I got that one. Um, but yeah, it, it's, yeah, well, here I am, so. Here you are. We're <laughs> delighted that you are here. And Sinead, would you like to? Sure. Um, I, uh, I'm a writer, uh, and I published a book of essays this year, a lot of which deals with the body and medicine and illness, because I've had a couple of experiences um, one of which, two of which were quite major, one of which was a, a diagnosis of an acute leukemia that came with a lot of other uh, diagnoses at the same time, including a massive pulmonary embolism. Just, just it for the kicker, um, it, like the leukemia wasn't bad enough, um, and have been through that whole system and had a lot of very uh, interrogative and not very pleasant treatment, but um, still here. Um, and also, I, I'm really fascinated by medicine and science being not of that persuasion. So any chance I get to hang around with doctors and <laughs> science people, I never say no. We're going to come back to Sinead in just a moment for an, an excerpt, but before we do, uh, Orla, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Kira. Yeah, my name is Orla Shields. I'm currently the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences here at Trinity, but up until about May, I was the Director of Trinity's Translational Medicine Institute, and that's based up in St. James's Hospital. And that's important because it's a, it's a sort of centre that allows patient-centred research. So we work very closely with clinical colleagues and basic scientists in order to try and uncover mechanisms or potential targets for diagnostics, but also for understanding um, the pathogenesis or how disease progresses, and then working with other basic scientist colleagues to try and see if there are targets that we can use that might be druggable, that drugs might be uh, developed for that. So um, as well as being the dean, I'm professor of molecular diagnostics, and I've worked quite closely with a lot of biotech companies to develop novel diagnostics for the early detection and monitoring of cancer. Okay. So the panel is, as you can see, made up of sciences, medics, patients, and obviously we would love your interaction at the end. But before we kind of get stuck into us all talking, maybe Sinead is going to read from Constellations. Sinead? Yeah, I'm going to read... Um, the, the longest essay in, in the book is, is actually about blood because I'm, I'm interested in all aspects of it, um, the etymology of it, uh, blood performance artists, uh, DNA, all sorts of stuff. So I talk about that. But I'll read you a short, a short section, which was um, the, the night that any patient is, is possibly one of the worst nights of your life, which is the night that you get told news that you don't really want to hear. Um, uh, so the piece is called 60,000 Miles of Blood. Um, the day I was diagnosed, I'd been married six months to the day, so uh, we were planning to go out for dinner, but my body had other ideas. Um, so I'll just read uh, a little section from that. Um, it's divided into the eight sections, A positive, A negative. If you take all the blood vessels in an adult body, veins, arteries, capillaries, and lay them out in a continuous line, they're said to measure 60,000 miles. Typing these words, fingers to pressing keys, there's a movement of tendons across a pale landscape of skin. 
but I was warned to wait for the roving mic if something happened. Thank you. Typing these words, fingers to pressing keys, there's the movement of tendons across a pale landscape of skin. But what I notice most is the blue of the veins. Every slim stream, each a messenger of the blood working away unacknowledged. Over the years, several cannulas have been attached to my arms, pre-surgery or when the veins at the elbow collapsed like a coal tunnel. Each time, a phlebotomist offers words as preparation, but they're never the right words, always inaccurate about the sensation that follows. You'll feel a scratch or a nick, they say. It feels like neither. In my late 20s, six months to the day since I was married, I found myself in an ambulance on a cold, glass-clear January morning, a paramedic holding me upright because it was too painful to sit or lie on a stretcher. Later, in the hum and chaos of the hospital, I was told that something of concern lurked in my blood. I hadn't suspected there was anything wrong until I found that I couldn't bear any weight on my right leg. The throb and sear of it continued and a doctor dispatched me to casualty where I waited on a trolley in a tiny room beside two pensioners. That I was stationary for 72 hours now seems terrifying given that the eventual diagnosis was deep vein thrombosis, DVT. A doctor speculated that it had been caused by the contraceptive pill so anticoagulants were administered in elephantine doses. Weekly visits to a warfarin clinic followed, an airless room where I sat among old women, a sea of silver heat-treated hair, the youngest person by decades. Warfarin comes in a trio of strengths and colors, pink the strongest, followed by blue and then brown, but no matter what colors I took in rainbow combinations, my coagulation level bounced around like a skimmed stone on water. A persistent cough percolated in my lungs, and one day I woke to find my legs dotted with black bruises. More than 20 mottled circles. They weren't trauma-inflicted, so they didn't hurt, and I know now that this phenomenon has a name, ecumosis, from the Greek, ecumosis, to pour out. The colour frightened me. It wasn't recognisable as anything from the usual bruise spectrum, night sky, purple, pond green. Everything felt ominous. Night sweats, night sweats woke me constantly and it felt that there was worse to come. What was happening to me? With illness, there's always a sense of before and after. The before time when everything is bright and even keel and normal, a word that loses all meaning in the face of disease. The final moments of before, just as it slowly dawned that bad news was coming, was when a haematology registrar, kind, blonde, about my age, used the word blast. Her reference was not to having fun, or Star Wars gunshots, or a wind gust that cuts you in half, but to myeloblasts, immature white blood cells that spill out from the bone marrow. This was a new word, and used in a medical context was enough to ping the synapses to make me ready myself. I fished for answers, dropping a line into this new terrifying water. The haematologist was circumspect, eventually admitting that there was an irregularity in the bone marrow. Like leukemia, I asked. And in that moment, I didn't know where the question came from or how I made such a leap from bone marrow to cancer, but what did I know in this land of before? To be an undiagnosed patient is to be in a constant state of fear, of waiting for the revelation. Offering a hazarded guess is an attempt to compute or accelerate the truth. On that Sunday, it felt like the weighing up the facts of my body, the black bruises and night sweats and chest heaving cough were coming from somewhere. Thank you, Sinead, and, and it's just incredibly eloquent. Um, before we kind of get stuck into the science and, and, and all about where we're going with the future of, of cancer treatments or diagnostics or anything, Owen, when you hear that, and obviously Sinead writes very beautifully and, uh, and, and describes the fear in, in a very poetic and eloquent way, do you relate to it? Do you remember the, the, the being told, uh, you know, in your early 30s, you have a brain tumour, that this is a, a cancer inside your head. Do you remember what that was like, that journey through the medical? I, re I remember it all. I remember being there and hearing it, but I, I certainly couldn't put it into words like those. That was really something. Um, yeah, I, I fear, of course, but um, I just also, I, I've always had to just get on with it 
mentality as well and, and look at the positive sides. And, um, you know, there was no point in, in worrying about something unless, you know, you could do something about it. So I just, yeah, I've always tried to stay as positive as I can. And I think that's good, not just for me, but for, you know, loved ones, friends, family around me as well. Um, but yeah, I, I, I remember that the, the, when I was first in, in the local hospital, they met, someone mentioned, like one of the doctors mentioned TB. And uh, I remember being, what, TB? You know, and I, I think I said to him, because one of the questions they'd asked me before they knew what was going on is, had I been to West Africa? I think they thought I had, maybe I had SARS or something. And um, I, I said to him, that there's, you know, how, how would I have TB? And he said to me, there's, there's probably more TB in Whitechapel where we were than in the places you're thinking of. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different things going through your mind, but as you, as you said, when you don't know, at least when I had a, a, a couple of scans and they could say what it is, you can sort of then, I guess, begin to move on from it and, and yeah, deal with it and start the process of, of treatment, uh, which in my case started very, very quickly, so yeah. Not much of a lag between diagnosis and, and, and intervention. Orla, I'm going to come, come to you next. If I might. One of the things we said we would discuss this evening is, I suppose, around Irish survival rates of cancer. And, and obviously, there are lots of things we're doing well, and there are some things we could improve upon in terms of outcomes here currently for patients. Do you want to talk a little bit about where we're at in terms of how Ireland is positioned, I suppose, as compared to other countries vis-a-vis -vis how patients in Ireland are doing who have cancer? Okay, and I, I suppose I'd start by saying it's difficult to generalise because there are certain areas we're doing well in, others we're falling behind, and overall we're not that bad, we're a bit behind you know, many other Western countries or countries where they would have an advanced medical system. Um, I think the thing that makes the difference to the successes that we do have is where you've got that perfect mix of clinical excellence, some basic research, and translational research and patients who are generous enough to engage with the process because without their buy-in you know you can't possibly get blood samples tissue samples material that basic scientists need to try and understand what's happening at a cellular or a molecular level and without that the surgeons or the clinicians are stymied with where the state of the art currently is so it's it's an amazing thing when you get a good partnership. So one example perhaps in Ireland where we're particularly good might be in the area of esophageal cancer. So it's a cancer which has a pretty poor prognosis. We actually box above our weight in Ireland and I think that's probably due to that perfect storm. You know we've got excellent surgeons, really really engaged research nurses, researchers in the lab and patients who are so committed, despite knowing that they may not be the direct beneficiary of some of the work that's going to happen, being sufficiently invested in others who are going to go through their same journey, that they're willing you know, to put themselves through more than they possibly need to in order to make it easier for somebody else. So that generosity of spirit, which I think Irish people have in yeah. shedfuls, is something that really helps us you know, advance faster than we might otherwise. There are other areas where we also do particularly well, and it's probably controversial to say, but where we have screening and where it's you know, deployed efficiently and effectively, it is an amazing intervention that will help us detect cancer earlier. Um, so where, where those programs are working, we are making inroads. Um, areas that we still fall short on would be in areas maybe like ovarian cancer. Some of the cancers that are somewhat more sinister because they grow away and by the time you start to feel unwell, and I don't mean this sounds terrible, but the, one of the reasons you might have presented so early was because there's only so far something can grow. There's a, a cranium that's stopping you know, expansion. So in someone's abdomen or their tummy, you know, cells can grow for quite a long time. And so the disease can be quite advanced before it, it can be detected or before it even presents as any form of difficulty. And so that's an area where we don't do so well um, and we need to try, I mean, because what we do know for sure is when you can detect things earlier, you can get better outcome. Okay. And in terms of what would make a difference to the areas maybe that we're not doing as well, I mean, you mentioned something like ovarian and, and that, 
diagnostics would be key, but maybe yeah. we don't get in early enough. And it's, yeah. it is hard. I mean, I, 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 as someone who worked as a GP, yes. very often, all you ever saw was somebody, you know, maybe middle-aged, a woman yes. complaining of putting on a little bit of weight around her middle. Yeah. Every second woman was Feeling complaining bloated. of the same thing. Yeah. And, and not to be uh, patronising, but every, you know, people go, oh, and people refer to it as middle-aged spread and all this. So it wasn't a yeah. particular red flag in the way that some symptoms would be. What, what would it take to improve diagnostics? Is it funding? Is it, is it, when we talk about the recruitment and the retention yeah. crisis in medicine, is it, is it more people? Is it more expertise? What do we need? So it's, it, again, it's a mixture of things. So absolutely, funding is key. What has happened in Ireland, particularly in the last decade, Kleena, you'll agree or disagree with me, is that we have stopped funding basic research. There is still funding to some degree available for things that are closer to the market, you know, but you're not getting those you know, seminal discoveries that, you know, would make a disruptive change to the way we understand. Um, and that's just because of national policy. So that has definitely, you know, curtailed the, you know, advance, advancement. Um, other than that, I mean, there are exciting things happening. So the, there's an area, the area of liquid biopsy, I was saying to Sinead earlier, where we're looking to try and take blood samples, but not from patients who necessarily have a blood cancer, but who have a, a solid tumour. And those tumours shed cells, or they shed small fragments of DNA. And so by using advances in technology where you can really sensitively detect a small mutant fraction of DNA in a blood sample, which is minimally invasive, that has the potential to really transform the way we detect and monitor patients. Okay, so, so obviously diagnostics I yeah. is moving ahead and, and, yeah. and there may be people in the room down the line who are involved in, in, in that too. Martin, can I come to you next? We're talking about advances in diagnostics, but obviously one of the reasons that outcomes have improved for, for, for cancer patients is the advances that we've seen in terms of treatment uh, and in that whole area, clinical trials and, and research and development and treatment improving. Uh, we were talking about cancer back through the decades just before we, we, we started the talk in Ireland and the improved outcomes. Um, talk about, about the advances that have been made and perhaps future advances that we might expect to come down the line for patients living with cancer. Yeah, before I get to the nub of that question, I also wanted to add to the point that Ola's making that a lot of the advancements, I mean, you can talk about funding and you can talk about structural um, situations which are um, impinging upon that, but it's very lumpy. So when you talk about advancements and, you know, for example, I, I was reading that C cancer, tri uh, cancer um, CTI, uh, Cancer Ireland, has had its funding reduced by something like 20 percent, and that has a very profound impact on basic research but also access. And that lumpiness talks to about the advances. So one of the areas which is of deep, deep interest to me is, you know, advanced regenerative medicine. That's a large section of, of, uh, of advances within the area of which immuno-oncology is probably 60, 70 percent of it. And within that, you have things like cell, cell and gene therapy. So some of you may have been um, hearing stuff about car, um, CARs, chimeric antigen receptor uh, T cells, CAR-T, particularly in the treatment of blood cancers. Um, and that has been a real breakthrough. You know, if I think back to my doing clinical trials, you know, even 10 years ago, there's this huge excitement about immune checkpoint inhibitors, um, which some of you may have heard of, you know, drugs like nivolumab and pembrolizumab, and, there, and justifiably um, using drugs which actually help modify the patient's um, own immune system to actually uh, get a conquest of the cancer makes perfect scientific sense, I think we would all agree. But then you think about only one third of patients, roughly speaking, truly benefit from that approach. So the next step has been something which has been around since actually the 1950s. I mean, the first stem cell transplant was mid-1950s or thereabouts in the US or late 1950s. But the principle of taking cells, patients' own cells from their bone marrow, modify them so they become what I would call supercharged and super directed against the, the bad cancer cells is a big area of advance. And most of that, up until fairly recently, has been focused in the United States. 
And even in the um, UK, and interestingly enough, China. I mean, China is number two in that area, but very much at the basic research level. They haven't quite um, scaled up, shall we say, to actually get to the same number of patients. If I think about the United Kingdom, there are only a very small number of specialized centers which are able to administer and work with these CAR T cells. And that's just one small part of it. I mean, it's, it's a much bigger thing than, than just CARs. Um, so, you know, UCLH, which is, you know, in central London, is one of the leading centers in the UK, and there are a small number of others. But it's not, I, I'm not aware of any sites in Ireland really, really getting into that. But in the US, there's a lot of the large academic sites are in, in investing in that. And it's a difficult kind of area to be, but it's going to be the way forward. And it's difficult at many different levels. One, it's, it's hugely expensive, not just from the actual drugs, because there are two marketed drugs at the moment, or two marketed products, which you may have heard of. There's one called Kimria and one called Yescarta. And they're used for treatment for, for children with acute uh, lymphoblastic uh, leukemia. They're also um, a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So they're out there at the moment. They're vastly expensive. Uh, it may be like $3,700 a treatment, uh, or more, 4200 in one case. But that's not including the hospital costs, uh, which you know, it can be dub almost double the total cost of the care of the patient who might be um, subject to some pretty serious um, side effects. I mean, you, know, you were talking earlier about some of the side effects which were tolerable and weren't tolerable. And I don't know if any of you were in the UK and watched a program called War in the Blood, which the BBC screened about a few weeks ago, uh, which featured Dr. Claire Roddy at UCH. And I'm not doing her PR for her, but it was quite, in, quite a good program because it actually showed some of the very difficult sides of these, of these novel advances. Um, there's something called cytokine release syndrome, and then there's uh, you know, neurotoxicity. And the irony of it is that the more acute those immediate reactions are very often it's an indicator of efficacy and, and response. But the, not always, but, and, and it, is it is to an extent manageable. But that's where we're going to go. And it's very, very sensitive to funding. It's very sensitive to the capability and the structures within the site and patients' willingness to participate in the experimental studies which are going to, to be... Uh, the thing which is going to bring them to the fore, not just now in blood cancers, which is where the main focus has been, but also now in, you know, even in glioblastoma um, and, and other forms of solid tumours which are more difficult to use this kind of treatment in, which I'm sure you would be eminently more uh, qualified to talk about even than I. Than, than I. So I think the, the big areas in these, this regenerative medicine, which is cell and gene therapies, and I think this is the next generation which is going to make a massive difference in the outcomes uh, for patients, but we are going to have to be patient and we're going to have to make sure that it's well funded and to give both physicians and most importantly patients access to it, that is going to take good structures and better funding. Thank you. Um, can I just something that we, we were talking about a couple of minutes ago. So we were talking about um, ovarian cancer uh, and in Ireland and so on. Would I be right in thinking that the would you say success rates in treatment for that and 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 diagnosing would be a lot less than say breast cancer. Yes, absolutely. So, so to me that that you know funding and all that, but also just information communication. Mm -hmm. You know, you know the first time most of us probably hear of cancer is when you're, you're going to school one day and there's people wearing ribbons. Yes. It's breast cancer awareness. And when you're a child, I think you know it. It's but the first time you hear of cancer is probably when. You know, everyone's wearing ribbons. What's that for? Or, you know, maybe maybe someone in your family has has been. It's it's just it's always around. But, you know, I've never really heard people talking about ovarian cancer. That's just the one cancer, for instance. So, yeah, I really think information and, yeah. um, you know, that that obviously that that might be a funding issue as well. Um, but, yeah, people knew a bit more about it. I knew nothing about brain tumors before. Not, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. not that I would have gone. Oh, I have a brain tumor. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, I think that's yeah, uh, yeah very important for us, for everyone they, to think about. They do try, and there have yeah. been some campaigns around measuring your waist uh, and your girth. Uh, it's a horrible word, isn't it? Girth um, to see if you might be putting on weight. 
it also is a function of, of how many people are likely to get a cancer, yes. how much funding is put into For an area. Sure, and breast yeah. cancer is so common, it gets a lion's share. Now, you're right, it has had a good machine behind it as well by way of, I don't mean marketing, but a, an awareness and a kind of a lot of people talking about it. And there's been various yeah. high profile people who've come out yeah. and had it. Yeah. And that yeah. is weirdly helpful, the Kylie Minogue syndrome. Do you know what yeah. I mean? It, yeah. it, it oh, helps. Absolutely, yeah. It just does. It, um, it, it, I, I think that can also mean then for, for people with the less glamorous yes, cancers, yes, yeah. you can kind of feel a bit like, yeah. 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 you know, it's who's, incredible. where's my, where's my ribbon? <laughs> no, I think so. Where's my hot pants? No, I totally agree with you. Can I just, I just really want to bring Kleena in before because she hasn't said a word, if you don't mind, and then we're going to just let it all go everywhere, in fact. But Kleena, one of the things we haven't touched on and people keep talking about is one of the buzzwords around, around cancer is immunotherapy. Can you just, for people, and I know we have a very educated audience, but just, briefly outline what it is and where we're at with it and where we might yes. go with it as well and then we're going to go everywhere well just to pick up on what you're saying this is um, about um, informing this is the fantastic thing about being an immunologist and and kind of the awareness <coughs> now how powerful the immune system is we can start with exactly that we everybody used to think that the immune system simply tackled viruses or bacteria but now we know that the immune system tackles um, abnormal self. So something that's growing wrong or that's damaged, the immune system detects it and gobbles it up. And it's doing that really efficiently in most of us most of the time. But when a, a tumour, when a cell is growing abnormally, just sometimes that battle gets won, won by the, um, the tumour cell and the tumour suppresses the immune system. There are all these mechanisms by which um, ca cancerous cells can block all that immunology and there's as many different ways of blocking the immune system as there are many different types of malignant cells and you know I described all these amazing populations in the liver but the cancers have got even more ways of suppressing them but what we've discovered and this is what the immunotherapy is is that checkpoint inhibitors block the blocking and release the immune system so the immune system can get back doing its job so there are um, drugs that are the antibodies against the blockers, so those are the PD-1 inhibitors, and then there are um, modified engineered immune cells that can kickstart the immune system back in again. And we're really just, as you were saying, we're, we're just scratching the surface about understanding A, how the immune system works when it's working, B, how it gets blocked by the cancers when it gets blocked, and the ways then of releasing the blockages. So, and how are we going to discover? We need loads more money and loads more people. And so it's the really, it's just as Orla is saying, we need lots of um, sci basic scientists, but we also need the translational people and academic clinicians. We have so many smart, smart clinicians who um, are overwhelmed with looking after the patients. It's very difficult for them to have the time to do the research. I want to get. I, I don't need. Sorry, you don't need. Sorry. Uh, I want to get stuck back into the, to, the, to the patient journey through this. But but while we're on all the advances in diagnostics and treatment and future treatment and all that, all of you have mentioned, and I think it's probably clear, money. Everyone's talking about funding and money. Having said that, and obviously there are different funding models. We were talking about this bef before before the talk about that there it, there is, uh, I suppose, private industry funding it because pharma funds some of this, and then there's government funding and all of those things. Have we any concept, though, like going forward? Medicine back in its pre-interventionist days was relatively mm. cheap to deliver. And we had a working model of healthcare that, that sort of existed in that space where if someone had a heart attack or had cancer, they were kind of put in a bed and not a huge amount was done other than people looking at them and kind of nursing. And you know, we really did have a model that was very basic at one point. Now we're into such a high tech mm. area that as you say, we're scratching the surface of the body's own ability to, to fight cancer and all of those things. Where is the funding going to come from? <laughs> because you are talking billions, really, aren't you? To, to, and, and, and there is no one cure for cancer because as you have said, it's a multi-headed beast. How do we fund this? Is it going to be through taxation? Is it going to be through pharma? Is it going to be through patients having to pay ultimately? Because medicine, it's like as if you could buy a car once that cost 100 quid and now 100 quid I in the future is worth 1,000 quid, but the car now costs a million quid. I, it's exponential, out. the cost growth in, in, in medicine, isn't it? And I'll toss out one, um, 
the, uh, we were talking about this, the increase in cancer, in esophageal cancer is due to obesity, and uh, how about putting five cents on every bottle of soft drinks? That goes directly to research. So you're the saying that a, a taxation tax. model that, that might ring fence the tax yeah. that was taken, uh, like the way we tax cigarettes yeah. or we tax Do, do people or, know that um, yeah. there used to be a penny, in, I mean, a point one of a penny in pennies, when they really were pennies, in the old days on the pint of milk? that went to research, and that's how Ch Chagas, is at our Agricultural Research Institute, was unbelievably well-funded years before health research was any, all because of the milk. So are you suggesting one of the things that we might have to look at is, is, is let even not call it a tax, let's call it a levy, a levy on certain activity it's, that oh might no. be cancer, oh. sort, cancer cause. Sorry, no. I, I'm realising now how that might be interpreted. We, well, <laughs> let, I apologise. Continue that's to talk. What, what, what are you saying? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's just one one controversial idea. So I can, we'll come back to it because you've got sensible things. Mark, what, what do you think? Because you know the cost is a huge factor, and we don't live with with a bottomless pit of money. How are we going to fund it? So a couple of things. Say. First, I mean, we got to this discussion early because of my taxi ride this morning from the airport, um, where I had a very talkative uh, taxi driver who, once he found out what I did, because he asked, I didn't offer it. Uh, he said, oh, all that money, where, where does the money for the research go? I mean, you know, it's our taxpayers' money if it comes from the government, and what do we get back for it? You know, we don't get cheaper drugs and stuff like that. So, well, this, this pharmaceutical industry, oh, well, they're all out there to screw us, you know. So I was trying to make the point to him that if governments don't fund it and private sector doesn't fund it, we're all going to die from tuberculosis because there'll be no research. So it yes. came into this circular argument. But I think the answer is... Very enjoyable well, taxi journey. He was a very enjoyable <laughs> taxi journey. And he had, the he had the temerity to say, let's talk about Brexit. And I said, please, no. <laughs> um, keep talking. No, about no. Um, let's go back to uh, cancer. Let's go back to cancer, yes. Um, I think the answer is all of the above. And it's got to be a mixed model. And I wanted to say something again about the US. Now, I, I've, I've not lived in the US for a long period of time. But one thing I have, I have a lot of exposure and um, understanding of is that when it comes to screening, and this is the point I wanted to make, Owen, is that if you go to a major cancer centre in the United States, like Memorial Sloan Kettering or MD Anderson or a host, many, a host of others, it's a very high likelihood you would receive uh, a screening of a panel of genes, a very broad panel in the hundreds, as a matter of standard care, yeah. which is actually yes. funded by your health care, your insurance. So some of the things which would otherwise be missed, whether it's girth or, or circulating antigens or markers or biomarkers of cancer, you, you will be seeing what that is without even looking for it. And a friend of mine recently uh, has recovered from a variant. She had actually a fallopian tube cancer because she had private health care and she went for a well woman check. And as part of the well woman check, they looked at the panel of antibodies and say, hey, oh, something's up here and they managed to diagnose it incredibly early. And, th and that's a point, so well. Sorry, just to, to, to follow on from that, I mean, what that also allows us to do, were we able to roll that system out, is to use the expensive medicines we have more sensibly and to triage patients who will benefit from them. Right. So the, the concept you're talking about is this pre-enabling for clinical trial, effectively, where you screen a person at the outset for any mutations or any indicators that might be present that they will either benefit from a particular drug or not benefit from another drug. And so you can use the money that we have a lot more sensibly if you, if you invest top end in order to screen people. In first. the diagnostics and, and, and in all of those well, things. Well, it, it's, it's, it's tying in with the drugs that are available as well. So you're just screening them to see where there may be signals or triggers within the tumour cells that will benefit from or that will be um, ameliorated by using a particular drug. I am conscious, though, just because we're talking in a very science and a very science. medical yes. way, that, that I, I want to bring the guys back in. But also just when you look at somewhere like America, it's a very expensive delivery model of healthcare and single biggest cause of bankruptcy among American citizens is healthcare costs. And so there is a societal burden to a healthcare system that is 
so expensive that many of its citizens can't access it. So, so it's not it's inaccessible to the to the very poor. And and that's a question too that we might as uh, in our ivory tower as medics can go. This is wonderful. I throw money at it and I can do all these things. But actually, you're excluding people all the time when when you make it. So I, let's just, come back just, in. Just on that point, actually, I've just finished an incredible book by a writer called Anne Boyer. It's called The Undying: um, a Modern Meditation on Illness. Um, she was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer in the U.S. is a single parent, teaches writing, um, and talks about, I mean, she talks about having the double mastectomy and being discharged uh, as an outpatient and having it done as an outpatient and the sheer cost, not just of the drugs, but also how that healthcare model uh, discriminates against single parents, about people without a family or, or significant other, people of colour particularly. Um, and it's a absolutely furious and terrifying and, and brilliant Book, but also uh, lots of the treatment for triple negative cancer can actually kill you as well, which I'm, I'm quite, we were talking about it. The idea that yeah. there are you, get, you get and cancer moral and discussions you, here too. Yeah, so you get cancer and you get better and people think, oh, you got better, isn't that great? And then nobody kind of, there is a very high price to be paid for getting better because there are lots and lots of the things that make you better can damage you in other ways. In, in my case, um, I, my leukemia was acute promyelocytic and I had, uh, I was given a drug called Atra, which only works in this type of leukemia, which saved my life. Ten years before, if I'd, if I'd got it, the chances were one in five of surviving. It's very, you bleed on a brain, and you bleed on the brain, you die within a week, generally, is what used to happen. Um, and I was having lots of problems with breathing when I was pregnant with my daughter, and they said, oh, did we not tell you that, that the um, Ida Rubicin can really damage your heart. I was like, no, no one told me that. And no one tells you that because I get the, the first thing to do is to save your life and have you not die. And that's throw everything at you, even the most things with incredible toxicity that is going to have. And, and you know, my mother's had cancer twice and has all sorts of problems with nerve endings and nerve damage. And But she's alive and I'm alive. And that's the, that, that is the trade-off and payoff. But people don't tell you that at the time. This, this book, though, is in, it's, it's, a, it's furious. The carcinogenosphere, she calls it, when she talks about the um, capitalistic sort of structural uh, payment issues in the US about how it doesn't, I mean, I, I would, I, I, we'd look at the NHS and I don't know what's gonna happen after Brexit because you know, we have different models here at the NHS which I think is incredible. I, I, I would be terrified to get sick in America. I absolutely don't know what would have happened to me if I'd gotten sick in America. And it's, I mean, the, the, the economics and, and, and money and financial elements of medicine yeah. are, aren't often talked about as well, which is a separate uh, economic economics question to funding. don't exist yeah. in a vacuum. Do you, yeah. as, as I suppose all I was saying, I didn't even mean to go down that road, but when, I, when we talk about the model of funding in America, America is able to do things other countries can't do, but equally, there is. It's not across the board. Yes, yeah. it's, just it's lumpy too. To yes. use that word you were talking about earlier, is it lumpy? Uh, we're coming towards. We've we've more a little bit more time, but we're coming towards. Just in terms of, I mean, Owen and Sinead, you, you have both lived with cancer, lived through cancer, the recovery from cancer. Is it what you expected? I mean, people talk about all the various narratives around cancer. You're going to fight it, and you're going to beat it, and. Uh, you know, people talk whether that's helpful or not. I, I, I don't know if it's helpful or not, and I can understand the arguments maybe for and against. But, but was was the recovery was your journey through the recovery, and was it what you would have predicted it would have been had you ever thought about it in advance of your diagnosis? I guess pr probably like most people, when I when I before I was sick, what I would have thought about would have been stuff you might see in TV or movies. You know, people losing their hair and lying around losing weight. Um, I didn't lose that much hair, <laughs> although I had a lot uh, to start with. Um, and yeah, there was there was few times where I was really, you know, completely bedridden. And when I was, it was, you know, we were talking about the, the effects of the treatment. It was it was from the bloody chemotherapy, you know. Um, it could really, really just knock you for six. Um, so yeah, the uh, I'm losing my trailer thought, sorry. Um, yeah, there was nothing that, I don't know, I, I never felt like I was surviving. I felt like I was getting on with the treatment, and for me, I'm very lucky that it has been going well. I'm, I'm, I still have scans every few months, um, so I don't know, the next, the next scan I go to, things could change, um, the thing might start growing again, and then I'd be on more treatment. And I, I haven't even asked what that treatment would be, because. I just don't think there's any point in worrying about it until I have to. I could spend, you know, my next scan's in three months. I'm not going to spend three months going, oh no, what if? You know, if I've, I've never done that because, you know, there's, it's just, or actually when, when, I, when I said this to the doctors last time, um, they said actually people who are doing well tend to do better. So it's actually more likely that you'll continue on your, your I don't know, your, 
Yeah, the trajectory for which for me is, is as good as it gets, which is my tumor hasn't grown for a while. Let's hope it doesn't grow for a, a, a hell of a long time, yeah. yeah. So, um, a yeah. Lot, a lot of times though, when you talk to, to people who have had <coughs> cancer, though, when they talk about their experience of it, and, and I'm going to ask you the same question, Sinead, about what might have improved your experience around it, or particularly your, your interface with, with the medical end of things, we as doctors often talk about the science and, and the, the technical things that we're doing, the best mm -hmm. drugs and everything. And people often say, I wish they'd talked to me a bit different. I wish they were a bit kinder. I wish they had a bit more time with me and things like that. Um, and uh, so occasionally, dare I say it, in, in, in the science gallery surrounded by professors and scientists, sometimes it's the human aspect of, of, of the journey through cancer that <coughs> is the bit that sticks in people's mind and, and is the important bit aside from all the obviously high-tech immunotherapies and, and surgeries and chemos and radios and everything else that goes with it. Would you say that that was true of you, that, that, that there were other aspects to the holistic um, experience of being a cancer patient that could have been changed or improved? Uh, in terms of you know, my experience with the NHS, in my case, um, I, I just think they've been fantastic. You know, there's, I haven't had, and I, and I know some people, some people who I, I was doing a, a Macmillan project with who didn't have a great experience, but for me, the only, the only hang up was try, initially trying to get to see my GP. I live in a, a, a busy area in London, so that was a slog. But once I'd seen the GP, things moved pretty quick, um, surprisingly quick, you know, it wasn't long after the first appointment that I was being told, yep, yeah, you're, you're in for brain surgery this Saturday night. Um, and I, I met some great, great people. My, we, there's a, I, I believe they're over here as well, a clinical nurse specialist, so a CNS. Um, the first uh, CNS I had was phenomenal and took so much time with me, not just with me, but um, my now wife, uh, who was at, my girlfriend at the time, was upset one night. Um, about me being sick, and I said, "Why don't you ask uh, Katie, the CNS? You know, just yeah, give her a call." And uh, Samantha, uh, my wife, r called Katie, the CNS, next day, and Katie said, "Come down and see me, and we can chat." And um, uh, you know, that's phenomenal so care there was, and service. There was support there. For yeah, you, oh yeah, for big time. Yeah, and and not just with the NHS, but Macmillan um, have been phenomenal. Uh, I think actually it's fair enough to say that, well certainly I, all my treatment now is in the Macmillan Cancer Care Center in, as part of UCLH. Um, I moved to UCLH because I knew that's where the, the, um, the trials were going to be and I wanted to be the, there to jump on them. Um, but even aside from any treatment stuff, they do a lot of, uh, I did a, a filmmaking course through, through Macmillan. You can you know, do massage, yeah, you can, you can do lots of courses, art therapy, all these things. You can go for a massage so if you is want. So there's a huge amount. I, I quality of life oh, absolutely. aspects are cared for. Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, that's, that's my personal experience. I, I was probably in a great, um, a great NHS trust, and I moved. Uh, so initially, I was in one called St. Bart's. That's where I met. That'll be CNS Katie, and I'm in UCLH. I've got a different team, but they've always everyone I meet is yeah really great. But you know, as I said, through doing that film course. Um, sadly, one of the girls who, who I did it with, uh, it was her funeral last week, you know, and this time last year we were out making a film together. Um, and she, I know that she, she, had a, she had an awful trouble all the way through her treatment with feeling like she wasn't getting told what's what. And in th I think the last couple of months when she was in, in hospital and not really getting out much, she was still, I was talking to her and her mother, and they were still like pretty much banging their heads against the wall yeah. trying to to move even to different floors of the hospital or get home when they thought they could get home and basic things like that. So it's, I, I, guess, I, I guess it's all, it's individual very individual, experience. yeah. Sinead, what would you say if there was something that could have been improved for you <coughs> as, a, as, a, as a person who was living with cancer and going through all that medical system? What, what would you have liked to have seen maybe done better or changed? Well, interestingly, uh, my first major experience with hospital was m most of my teenagers with orthopedics. Uh, I had, had a lot, a lot of surgery and eventually had a hip replacement in my 30s um, with, and had a nightmare with the, the doctor who did that. I have permanent 
back damage because he would, he took a year not to do it. And there's another conversation to be had about doctors not listening to what women have to say. Uh, the gendering of that kind of, I don't hear you, I'll prescribe painkillers for one patient and not for you. Um, but that's a whole other argument. Um, but by the time I came to be, to, I, I was treated in St. James's in the Burkitt, you know, which is a very isolationist sort of place, uh, you know, double doors and aprons and masks. Um, it's a very lonely place. I did the full six months and then two years of maintenance. Um, and I had, you know, uh, I had fungal pneumonia, my lungs collapsed. I had all sorts of other problems while trying to get the treatment. And one thing that the, the, I couldn't fault the treatment, it was absolutely amazing, but I, I've said it regularly, and I say it a lot in this book about the idea of empathy and listening. It, you know, seven H1s doesn't make you a doctor. Um, bedside manner and empathy are things I think are absolutely teachable, and you can be a, a you know, molecular whiz and a, an unbelievable scientist, but if you don't know how to talk to a person or look them in the eye or make them feel okay, and I get that doctors are very busy and overworked and tired and don't have time for a 10 minute chat, but it's the, that the moment, the, the 50 seconds or whatever it is, moment interaction, you can put someone at ease. So I didn't really get that. No one does actually talk to you when you, when you do get a diagnosis of cancer, which is the most terrifying diagnosis you can get. No one ever says, are you all right? How are you doing? I do remember when you mentioned massage, the only kind of element of pastoral care that I did get was that there was a nun who would come around and she would give you facials whether you wanted one or not, which was involved <laughs> bashing the face off you with a load of lavender oil. And that was the kind of most respite only in Ireland. <laughs> Yeah, so, she was very nice. They have she art meant, therapy. She meant well, and film but, making. But you, you, you just would have liked someone yeah, to come in and kind of occasionally say, "How are you doing?" Yeah. But, but I had the most amazing uh, hematologist, Professor Paul Brain. He came to my book launch. I think the world of him, and, and he saved my life. So. Yeah. Yeah. But, but clearly there are things we could do a little bit, bit better. Yeah. We'll move it back for the end and then we're going to take questions just to, to the science. Clinical trials obviously are, are something that patients, particularly if the prognosis has been poor, um, want to be involved in and, and are desperate to get on to and indeed are, are the, we talked about funding and everything. Where are we at in terms of, we, we have relatively few clinical trials. Is that just a function, maybe, um, Orla or Keen or, or, or any, Martin as well, of, 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 of population? We're small. Is it partly that or, or is it funding or is it, is it that our health service isn't robust enough to take them in some way? i just comment very briefly in the pass over. It's a combination of all of that, just as Orla said. And it, um, a big problem wa was the um, hospitals very spread out and um, consultants looking after small numbers of patients and therefore not having the infrastructure, not ha having access, so making the cancer centres, and so it's exactly as you say, those cancer centres that are in the states um, are able to have the infrastructure to deliver um, clinical trials. So it's a major problem in this country. We are very far behind, and there's a few people who are really banging that drum. Now, hopefully, and I'll let Orla mention about the Cancer Institute, but we are far behind, and our patients, uh, John Crown would be one of the first to have started. If I was to ask that. you the question, yes. Supposing we were to, to uh, and it would be politically very charged thing to do, particularly in this country. But would we be better off having one centre of excellence for cancer or something oh, along those absolutely. lines here? Yeah, with that's why I was passing, going to pass it over to us. That's exactly what should happen. Now, or let me <laughs> ask you, Dan, because that... And I'm not suggesting that there is only one centre of excellence for cancer, but I do think for this idea of a, a comprehensive cancer centre, the type of approach that they've pioneered in the US, throughout the UK, other countries in Europe, we are not... I mean, our population is, what, something about the same as Birmingham? Birmingham. You know, so... Birmingham doesn't have five comprehensive cancer centres. You know, so, so there is an argument from the, the numbers point of view. Do we um, need to then, as an Irish headspace, decouple ourselves from the idea that we can have a hospital in every county that well, uh, serves yes. high-tech medicine? The, we might do other know, things. The, the Centres of Excellence strategy has tried to do that. Still quite a lot of them. There are quite a lot of them. What we've been doing, now banging my, our own drum, with Trinity and St James's, is to try and develop a cancer institute as you would have in the United Modern. States. So just recently we've been OECI, so that's the European accreditation body, has given the Trinity St. James's Centre or Institute um, cancer centre status. So it's recognised where we are falling down, where we fall short of being a comprehensive cancer centre measured. So our research matches what would be there internationally, our clinical um, acumen matches what would be there internationally, where we fall down is the number of patients that we recruit. And I think the limiting factor there is that, not that we, we, we have smaller numbers of patients, but we have really, really good physicians who phenotype, who characterize the patients really, really accurately. The difficulty is it's, it's, it's practical. 
So in order to enrol the patient in the trial and then do all of the follow-up material, there's, it's not just the admin burden, there are extra visits, and it, it's just a, a resourcing issue. So we have far fewer oncologists, clinical oncologists, than they would have in a comparative centre in the UK. We don't have the research nurses who could do a lot of that enrolling and going through questionnaires and giving additional follow-up to patients that they would have there. Um, and it's, it's, it's only a small turn of the dial that would get us from the you know, abysmal you know, 2% that we have. 10% is what would be required as a minimum for a comprehensive cancer centre. So we are considerably far from yeah. it. But having identified it as the one impediment that we have at Trinity St. James's for becoming the comprehensive cancer centre, we're you know, marshalling all of our resources that we can in order to try and get that number up. There's a question and a point, and, and one of the, the question is, is that the point that somebody uh, mentioned to me, I think it was about a year, a year and a half ago, one of the issues that we have in Ireland, if I compare to the UK, um, specialists and research uh, physicians are encouraged and have protected time mm -hmm. to perform exactly. research. I mean, academic clinicians, exactly. academic you don't have time. And yes. that's not right. something you exactly. have here, which is a, a problem. Yeah, exactly. And I think another point, you know, we talk about lung tests, we talked about the US, you know, access to clinical trials. If you take a hospital like Christie Hospital, which is a specialist cancer center in Manchester, you know, they're publishing data that's saying three quarters of the patients they see at Christie are on some form of clinical trial. Marsden, Royal Marsden will say close on 100% probably, or, or uh, sorry? We're 10%. Yeah, 10%. But it's the centers of excellence do see an awful lot. Duke in the US says 100% of its patients are on clinical trials, and it's a specialist center in glioblastoma, by the way, in, in Duke. But um, North Carolina, long way to go. Um, <laughs> but on, on the other hand, one of the points I was going to make in, in terms, you know, to you, Siobhan and, and, and Owen, is it is my sense that these specialist centers have physicians who, at the, the experience that patients have in these specialist cancer centers is so much better. Now, I, exactly. It, because the whole framework is, is also patient-centric, not exactly. just science-centric. And, and that's where, and, and Ireland, you may have a 4.8 million or so population. There's no re rhyme or reason why it couldn't, in one or two uh, specialist cancer centers or centers of excellence, couldn't emulate that. Yeah, which is what we're actively trying yeah. to do. Can I just yeah, go for it. Uh, just to go the, the opposite end of the spectrum from the patient who didn't have a clue about any of this sort of stuff. I remember the, my first day in hospital, in my mind, whenever I was lying there on my own, I remember thinking, when's someone going to come around with like a clipboard and ask me about like my lifestyle, for instance, or how I, you know, wh where are they going to figure out where, where this thing came from? And, you know, they never did. And it's only recently, I was a friend of mine who's um, uh, a doctor in, in London, and she's, she's doing a, a PhD and uh, she won a, a bursary, so it was, you know she's she's now got all this time and and money to to do her research, and I said, well, you know, I guess there's there's no one who's paying someone to go into the the uh, oncology ward in down in Whitechapel to, you know, with the questionnaire, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was my very yeah I guess wet behind the ears patient thing. I, also, on a, a sort of a light note, I also wa walked up. When they said I was ready to go, I walked up to the to the, the reception desk on my ward, like like you're walking up to pay for a meal at the way out. And I, I had my wallet halfway out of my jeans, and I was like, "Who do I ask for the bill?" <laughs> and um, then I realised I was like, oh, "It's the NHS. You don't pay." And I was like, <laughs> "Right. No, thank God you don't pay, because I, you know, I didn't have that much money on my uh, in my account." <laughs> um, I've seen, I, I'm in a couple of Facebook groups for people with GBMs and, and other things, and someone posted up a, a copy of like a, a receipt, a, a payment receipt for uh, treatment they'd had in, in a, a US hospital. And uh, it was like MRI and like a couple of thousand dollars or something like that. I've lost track of how many MRIs I've had. Like, I, I felt like I was having them ev like every, every day for a while at one point. I've had three surgeries, and they do a couple before surgery and then one after surgery. I go back for them every three months um, at the moment, but yeah, I've, I've, I've had so many. And then, then you think, uh, you know, you'd be paying for a nurse, and uh, you know, I have three, 
three rounds of brain surgery with, with you know, going in and meeting the, the anesthetists and they're, you know, pretty well-paid people and, and so, so they should be. And then a, a, a bunch of really senior brain surgeons and all the registrars and everything, you know, yeah, lucky, luckily I didn't, I never actually asked for the bill. So <laughs> I guess Boris is paying for um, it. Before we throw questions to the floor, is there anything any of our panelists would feel we haven't touched on or we didn't get to say that you kind of were coming up here intending to get to say before we start that you'd like to add before we ask the audience what they'd like to hear? Let's say the audience. Yeah, let's we see. throw it to the audience, we throw it to the I'll, floor. I'll just say thank, thank you, Professor, for um, your, your, uh, the way you described immunotherapy because it's something I hear a lot of talk about. Um, there was talk of drugs like Iplum, Iplum Nuno Bad a couple of years. That's right. So it's, it was great to hear you explain that in, in a, a way that I, I understood. Oh, thank you. I actually <laughs> loved the way you explained it in such an enthusiastic way. Yeah. <laughs> I, I well, it gives us hope as well, doesn't it? <laughs> it was yeah. brilliant. Um, we, we are live streaming, so we would love to take questions, and you rarely get so much expertise from all different aspects up here again. Um, but if you just would wait till a, a mic gets to you, because that way that the people might, who might be watching online would be actually able to hear your question as well. Would anyone like to ask a question of any of our guests this evening? Yes, this lady here. The mic will be with you just a sec. Um, so just a really quick question. Maybe this is just a touch on what Orla was speaking about. Um, and I know Kina and Martin mentioned it as well. So I understand that obviously we don't recruit, well not that we don't recruit sites, but we don't have you know, the clinicians available that are mainly um, focused on work for clinical trials, so they have the time and the resources available to take on or enroll subjects. If we did have those resources, would we still be in a position whereby even if we had doctors and nurses available to dedicate their time to enrolling subjects in uh, clinical trials, so say if we happen to manage that part of it and we tackled that difficulty, would there then be, say for an example, um, an issue with training? So obviously, you know, clinical protocols are quite specific. There's a lot of, you know, we're normally monitoring patient safety quite closely. There's a very intense visit schedule, depending on obviously the disease indication. So would we, or is there two challenges essentially? One, the recruitment of the staff, but then two, the training to ensure that the patients are being screened appropriately, being enrolled appropriately, and then they're being followed for the duration of the trial. Is that a challenge that we have as well on top of just the resourcing alone? And okay. would there be enough patients as well, I suppose? Well, um, yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there, there would be because, you know, we don't have to recruit. The, the, the clinical trials um, tend to run in multinational <coughs> areas, so there would be a requirement to recruit X number in a given site. So you would predetermine you know, what a reasonable number would be. And, so yeah, and you and wouldn't so do you it without could, that number. You wouldn't do it without that sure. number. With regard, your, your point is really well made with regard to the protocols, to the safety issues, and that's why I think, again, not to be banging our own drum too much, but the, the Trinity St. James's model, because we have a clinical research facility embedded within St. James's Hospital, you have that expertise, you've got the hierarchy and the governance already in place to safely and effectively roll out clinical trials. So I think, you know, on its w w absent that, it would be an additional challenge that might be push you over the edge. But by, you know, pooling our resources and getting our capacity where we have it aligned, I think it is actually attainable, and it's certainly not sufficiently scary that we shouldn't at least give it a damn good try. Yeah, just to add to that, uh, just tiny, two tiny examples. There's because of the awareness of exactly what you're talking about, these additional educational opportunities are being made. And just even specifically, there's a master's in translational oncology, and several of the graduates from that are, appro are appropriate for exactly this work. And there's a new MSc in immunotherapeutics, which has a big chunk on cancer immunotherapeutics, and the, the graduates from that. So, um, if we could only align the whole lot, <laughs> push it. So the elements are there. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah. But you, the point is very well made. I, I'm guessing you Actually, work for a clinical research organisation. I work for ICON. Well, I'm a project no, manager in ICON. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I studied here, so. I recognise you. No, I, I, no, I think there's a, there's a lot of issues at stake here. And there's two points I'd want to make. First and foremost, in terms of the um, expertise at sites and the staff, it's actually getting more difficult. I mentioned earlier these cell therapies. Yes. Um, 
which, as I say, are at the moment are a, a big deal in liquid tumours, in leukaemias and lymphomas, but we're, it's going beyond that. We're scratching at the, the surface. Solid, yeah, it's scratching on the surface, as you said. And the, le the intensity and the interdepartmental um, coordination that re is required there at the moment is, is very high. So it's going to be an even more intense training purpose. But I also want to bring this back onto the patient because what part of the training is, and I, you know, I'm plugging the BBC again for whatever reason, what this TB program actually showed when they showed the car therapies at UCLH was how the patients and their families had to, to face the issues. And that's an element of training which cannot be underestimated. At the end of the day, we're not doing this for fun. We're doing this because the patient, you, you as patients or ex-patients or current patients are at the center of it. And I think there's also a question about how complicated we scientists sometimes make clinical trials. There's this notion of patient centricity. You know, designing clinical protocols that one, answer as many questions as we want to ask for the betterment and improvement of the science and the outcomes for patients, but two, are not so ridiculously uh, inquisitive that it means making the lives of the patients who are already you know, under a lot of stress and maybe suffering even more difficult. I, you know, how many bone marrow, uh, how many uh, biopsies or uh, bone aspirates or the spinal aspirates are you going to take? That's, and I think there's a lot of responsibility upon us as scientists to, and I think with ph pharmaceutical companies is a big question there. You know, easy does it. Don't ask too many questions because there's the staff to train, there's the patient to be considered, and I think we're going in the wrong direction. We pay a lot of lip service to patient centricity in designing protocols for the benefit of the patient and with the patient's voice in mind. But Let's see if there are people who agree. Yeah. I, I'm wondering if there's people in the audience who agree with that. Are there people in the audience who agree with that? I have a question. Do you feel that we've moved too far away from patient centricity? Perhaps we don't have any patients here, though. It's hard to, it's hard to, it's hard to know. Um, would anyone else like to ask a question? This lady Hi. up here, how are you? Hi, so I just wanted to ask you one question. You said that there's not many uh, registered nurses uh, uh, to, give the, to carry out your protocol, as well as the empathy. You kept on stressing about empathy. So the question here is, do you really need somebody to be registered to treat a patient in a particular way. I mean, there are, Ireland does have courses in accountancy where they're training people who are not trained to be in a particular way. So there could be people from other backgrounds that you could train to have them treat a patient appropriately or make them comfortable. I don't think that takes a lot of funding. So would there be a problem with that? What do you think? What the, the question there, I suppose, is, is, is if we have a shortage of doctors and indeed of nurses, could we train up other types of allied uh, healthcare care uh, yeah. assistants of some uh, kind? And the, I mean, I think there, is, there are moves in that regard. So as Colleen has mentioned there, the Irish Cancer Society would be a case in point where there are courses available where there is emphasis placed on allied health professionals, where they do tremendous work, which isn't necessarily or doesn't at all require a medical qualification, but transforms the quality of a person where somebody can drive a patient to the hospital and bring them home. You don't have to have anything other than a driving license to be able to do that. And so there are lots of ways. Um, again, the hospital I'm familiar with is St. James's. One of the things that they do is social prescribing. So when somebody's being discharged, you're not just sent out with your list of drugs that you need, but you're told, you know, you may not be feeling like going out. So there's a Meals on Wheels service that can come in. You know, the news agent down the road, they, one of the uh, physicians in James's did a project with TY students, and he sent them out, and they, sort of, they basically Google mapped a whole area around Dublin 8. And so they know all of the news agents that will deliver the newspaper. They know all of the clubs that have center, you know, that have activities. They, will, they know where there are people who are available, make themselves available to drive a person. And so that so goes... Putting a wraparound Yeah, support so it's a social prescription in addition and to the medical And do you think, yeah. will we see that ultimately? We, we, we touched on earlier the, 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 the vast expense of delivering high-tech medicine. Will we see the stratification, do you think, of medicine, whereby perhaps it is physicians, oncologists, and scientists who are working in one area of, I suppose, health care, and then you'll have nurses delivering 
a level of expertise and maybe a bit more hand holding and then you'll have another group yep. all together who'll be purely empathic and um, and but there's dealing with there is also um I mean, there is also medical humanities, which has become yes. a huge thing. Um, and I know for a fact that um, Paul O'Connor teaches um, parts of Constellations and different books to first-year medical students in Trinity, encouraging them to read novels and to look at plays and to look at patient perspectives and look at books like this that do talk about that. Um, that is one way of, I mean, we, we all watch films and read books to get different people's point of views and, and imagine our way into different people's experiences. So that kind of, I think medical humanities is a huge and important way of teaching empathy without kind of going, now it's time for empathy class. Um, that's one way of doing it, I think. I actually agree with you. Yeah. I, I think if we become purely technocrats, yeah. uh, that, that yeah. we'll have lost something. But I was yeah. more wanting you to tell yeah. me what yeah. you thought. Yeah. Um, do, we, do we have another? We have this gentleman here. Uh, I'm a cancer survivor, double cancer survivor. And I'm just wondering about how the uh, GPs are linked in to the information about cancer and referring people. And also, uh, having been missed out, um, I was going to my GPs for a four to uh, four to three to four months coughing blood. I didn't even ask me to open my mouth. I had to ask for a swab to be taken. It came back uh, strep. I said, no, no, I stood up and said, no, there's something wrong. And then uh, within a week I was diagnosed with uh, based on cancer. Um, I'm just wondering how the, the uh, GPs are linked into it. And uh, because of my delay and it was, wasn't spotted, I'm just wondering if I'm a bit of a hypochondriac that every time I have a little squeak, I have to make sure that it's not cancer. I, I don't know if that... A tiny comment to, to add, and then I'll pass it over. It's an amazing story that you have, I don't, and to, to about your, your description about the book. Leah Mills has written the most amazing in book your about, in your face about her cancer. And I had just read it. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. I have the most brilliant dentist who loves reading. And I brought the book to him. And the next time I went into him, he said, thanks be to heavens, you gave me that book. I diagnosed a patient two weeks later. Do you know? The only other person I've met who had APML is Irish, but was in Scotland and had a toothache and went to the dentist, and the dentist diagnosed her with it. And um, was just quite dentists on the ball. Dentists diagnose mm. quite a lot of yeah. oropharyngeal mm. yes. cancers. They, they, they do. But I, did, I didn't mean to deflect yeah. from your, your question, which is about um, um, GPs. I, I was a GP. I was a GP for 20 years. Uh, so perhaps I'll go with that one. Um, I'm very sorry at your experience, and I'm very sorry that it took a while for you to get a diagnosis or indeed satisfaction. I much prefer hearing about the speedy diagnoses and things like that, all, all doctors do. Um, we are, as GPs, supposed to absolutely know about cancer. And indeed, I would go a bit further and say people, blood is always a red flag. We mentioned red flags earlier, but blood is always a red flag. Somebody coughing it up, somebody excreting it, somebody passing it into your, we never, blood should never come from anywhere where it's not supposed between, to come from. Between that time, I actually had gone down to my local hospital because I had vomited whole blood and I was sent home. Okay. Um, I'm, no, I'm not going to try and defend uh, of course, in I any way. That because I don't, I don't want to, do you know why? Because I don't want to defend the indefensible. Things get missed and doctors do miss things and sometimes they miss things through a lack of experience or through a lack of time or there are loads of reasons, but that's, I don't want to justify them. But, but um, absolutely GPs are supposed to be plugged in and in fact GPs, would see themselves as the gatekeepers to the health service, as it were, in Ireland, and that you, you, in the main patients, apart from people maybe who are admitted through the emergency departments, would attend their GP first of all, and then, depending, would be sort of signposted in a direction, maybe via referral to an oncologist or to whoever they thought was necessary well, for I, them I to see. I referred to an ENT specialist, but I waited 18 months in my local hospital, instead of my doctor saying, yeah. look, go to Vincent's, you know. And, and, uh, and again, indefensible. And, and, and one of the issues we have is timely access yeah, yeah. To, to treatment, but also to diagnostics. And that would be <coughs> something that would feed in when we were talking earlier to, to outcomes mm -hmm. and survival rates and all of those things. If patients can't get the scan or the swab or the biopsy or the blood test or whatever the, the, the specific diagnosis uh, that, that, that is necessary for what they have, then, then all the high-tech advances will make no difference because they're not getting into that part of the well, system I, in a I, timely I got way. I to see the, the uh, ENT um, specialist, and uh, she said, uh, I want to do a biopsy tomorrow morning. Uh, I want you in hospital tonight. Uh, the nurse said, who's your next of kin? Would you like a cup of tea? And I knew there was something wrong. I had to wait for uh, a biopsy for a week because I had blood thinners. 
uh, I hemorrhaged during the biopsy. I ended up with a trachea. Uh, within two hours, I had rested twice. And uh, so I've had a bit of fun. You have lived despite your care, <laughs> as opposed to because of your care, I would suggest. Look, uh, all I can say is I'm very glad you're here this evening. And um, we are far from perfect, despite many people doing their best. And there are definite holes in the system and there are definite experiences uh, that patients, uh, a bit like Owen was saying, he had a, a really good experience, but he would have had a, a, a friend who felt she got no information, was banging her head off a wall, is, is, is I think the words you used. A, a patient can be lucky and also mm -hmm. can be unlucky and it shouldn't come down to that. And I completely, I'd like to just say, I'm very sorry that was your experience, but, but, but I know a bit like you said, things are lumpy and, and, and patchy. Oh, and. And that is true, unfortunately, of other aspects of healthcare too. And as I say, I'm very glad you're here this evening and, and, well, uh, and looking well, dare I say. Well, for 71 and a half, not too bad. Not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, is there another, another question? Yes. Oh, and you want to say something? Uh, oh, I was just, you, you, when you were talking about social prescribing, yeah. um, so I mentioned that the film I did, that was all through Macmillan's social, social prescribing service. Yeah, so um, they had a, a, a nurse, and she, she's in, she was in Hackney Library every Tuesday and Thursday, and you email her and say, hey, can I pop in for a chat? Yeah, it was 4 o'clock, so I went into the library, sat down with her. She, she had, you know, his mountains of green paper guides for all these different things from Macmillan, packed full of amazing information, and she was going through different things they had going on in, in my area in, in Hackney, and... Um, None of them initially appealed to me that much. One of the things which someone said to me, which which stuck with me, was be, be wary going to some of the um, this kind of group, I guess, therapy sessions, and that what can happen in those is you end up taking on other people's sort of stories, and it could be people who are, who are really really sick, and you may be at the end of their journey, and I'm you know cycling down and coming in, you know, with my helmet and hey guys. So uh, I didn't really go into those, but I got an email a good while after about this film uh, project that they were doing down in Bow in a, a community center. And I emailed straight back within seconds. I was like, yes. Um, and there was about 25 of us sat down together. And over the course of eight weeks, one day, well, half a day a week even, um, learned how to shoot and direct and do sound and everything. And, and we made a, a little film. It was brilliant. And that was all completely free. Even the biscuits and all that stuff were free. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know, maybe that's something that if, if someone felt like they could do something like that, go off and do it, you know? You have to, plenty of people out there who are, who are sick. Um, and maybe I'll just say as well, um, one thing as a, as a patient, and it's, it's nothing to do with, uh, with any of the work you, you guys do, but um, things that I, 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 I liked and didn't like, I got quite, I was very open, I put it on Facebook, this is what's going on. And I got a, a handful of messages from people saying stuff like, oh, you know, my great aunt had cancer, you know, un unnamed cancer. She ate, she gave up meat or she drank this type of tea and she's grand now. And um, do do want, yeah, and do you want me to send her the number of the herb herbalist she got her tea from? And um, it's, it's just... Yeah, I, I, eat carrots. Eat loads of carrots. You'll be fine. I, yeah, and I, I just was like, I think I've one word I said. You know, thanks for all the uh, these amazing <laughs> ideas, but I'm doing my own thing and I'm happy with it. So you know, leave me be. Um, but if you do want to help, just yeah, see if your friend who, who's sick wants to go for a walk or wants you know watch a film or whatever. Very nice that that nurse met you. I think yeah. in the library, yes. which is a yeah. much more. Mm. Yep normal human place to go than a hospital. I, I worked yep. in hospitals for many years in the early part of my career, and I can still say to this day, I hate them. I find them very institutional, even as a worker bee in them. They always struck me as a place that kind of probably brutalized and crushed the humanity of those working there, mm. as well as the spirits of those attending there. They're not the best places, yeah. and a, a library is different. Places you can, as, as a patient, they're the least restful places yeah. you can be. You're, you're, you, there's constant interruption, there's beeping. always noise, there's always beeping, there's always obs and temps to be done. Like, you, you just don't get any, Every, any rest. Every 20 minutes, yeah. someone's so taking a something. A library is a very nice idea, yeah. I think, because yeah. obviously it has a completely different vibe to it. Yeah, but they also, I mean, that Macmillan at, at UCLH, 
have a Macmillan Cancer Centre, and it's UCLH is in a, a beautiful old, probably Victorian or maybe even earlier building, and there's one wing that is just for Macmillan, and you go in there, and it's staffed by volunteers, and lovely, like the, the volunteers are generally um, older ladies, but and there a lot of them you talk to, they they used to be nurses in the hospital, yeah. and they just love it, and now they go in there, and there's a lot of tea making, um, and leaflet handing out. And, um, but it's I lovely. would knock tea making. I think the restorative yeah, properties of tea are under. Oh no, I'm not knocking. I'm not knocking at all. Ones. I mean, they're, they're kind of therapeutic yeah. ones. Yeah, no, I'm not knocking at all. But just go in and chat to them, and just, and I, I think as well with, the, with the, the, the former nurses, they just love the chats as well. So I was in with a friend of mine. He, I, he just he accompanied me in for a, a, a dose of radiotherapy. And on the way out, I said, I just want to pop in here because they also have like financial advisors, so you can find out about benefits. So I was in, and the. The lady went off to make the tea, and she came back, and she handed the first cup to my friend Carl, who was there. And the two of them just chatted for 10 minutes. <laughs> and I was over reading the leaflets about benefits. And uh, then when it was time to go, Carl was like, God, they're so lovely in here, aren't they? I might come back. And, like, yeah. <laughs> and there's, that was the Macmillan. On the other side of the courtyard, they were building a Maggie's Center. And I, I've never been in. I'm not sure what it's like, but I think it's a similar sort of setup. Um, so you have, they're in the hospital, but then, yeah, in the library. and. Uh, then the, the course I did was in a, a totally different place, a, a community center. Um, so yeah, loads of the stuff that goes on is dotted around the city. Martin, I think, wants to say something. I just want to build on this point and also put in some familial plugs here. That we were talking about um, funding. The, the, voluntary, the voluntary sector is incredibly important. And you, you know, you've dwelled a lot on, on Macmillan's, I'm glad you man mentioned Maggie's Center. Uh, my wife works in the, voluntary, uh, the volunteer section of the Royal Free Hospital, which is just up the road from UCLH, and they're building a huge immuno-oncology immuno -oncology and immunotherapy uh, research centre now. I have no shares in that, by the way. It's a piece of information. But the, the point is about volunteer, you know, volunteerism, as, it, uh, as we were talking, and it goes back to a point I think you were building on. It's hugely important in the UK, but I'm afraid to say it's very confined to large metropolitan centres with you know, afflu in affluent areas. So UCLH, the Royal Free, Christie Hospital in Manchester, they'll have all that Maggie Centre, and they're building a big Maggie Centre, as I say, in, UC in Royal Free. They, you know, they're all there. But if you are in, dare I say, somewhere in, I don't know the geography of Ireland as well as, as you guys do, but you're right in the, the far end of County Wicklow or, or Mayo or something, you're not going to have, I, I dare say you would not have access to that any more so than you would do in, in Cleethorpes in the UK. We, we actually do have, yeah. dare I say it, a phenomenal volunteer sector yeah. in Ireland that is almost unrivaled uh, internationally. Yeah. Because, because we, I stand corrected. And, and it is actually quite community based. Now, it wouldn't have huge money behind it, well, but it exists in boreens and villages and all of yeah, that. It actually does. Sort of yeah. I, I, I encountered um, a piece of what I thought was absolute genius. A couple of years ago, I was doing some work out in Brussels just with, with, the, with the EU, and they were talking about various funded projects. And so in um, an area in rural France where, as with everywhere else, there is a considerable decline in the amount of conventional male people post. And they had this dilemma, what do we do with the, I'm going to be gender incorrect and just say post men, but you know what I mean, post people. Um, so there's a decline in the number of them. And they said, what are we going to do? Do we make them redundant? And somebody got some funding from the EU and they ran a pilot. And they said, what we'll do is we'll take the post people and give them some training for a couple of weeks and an iPad that's pre-programmed with an algorithm. And so if you live in a rural, isolated area, who will you always answer the door to? The postman. The postman. So the post person goes around, knocks on the door, and they'll go, Mr. Smith, how are you? Um, did you get your prescription this week? Tick. The nurse came to see an ulcer. Do you need her back again? Tick or not tick? Did you get your groceries? You know, is your electric working? So a whole load of social things, but actual really pertinent medical issues that streamlined, and depending on the buttons that were pressed on the iPad, the GP was alerted that it was a, a repeat prescription was needed. The district nurse was highlighted that you need to go and do a visit. They're integrating the social integrating care it. services. Yeah. Sounds great for geriatrics as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. people who are older. But I mean, with very little extra resource, if you use a bit of common sense, yeah. 
you can well, we have the exact same thing. Yeah. All our post offices are closing down all yeah, the time, and people are given out about that. So, yeah. so, so the same. So perhaps that would be a, a, a model that to could be considered be if it's being used. Would there be a, maybe a last question from the floor? If there isn't, it's totally fine. As oh, there is uh, this girl in black up here. Hi, yeah, I was just wanted to say that I I've worked in um, oncology in the UK and in Ireland, and just on the volunteer sector as well. In the UK and Scotland, especially, they have the Maggie Centre in Macmillan, and it's uh, everyone knows about it, and they're always fundraising, and it's it's really well publicised. But I feel in Ireland, there's probably the same amount of, of volunteering and fundraising, but you have like Ark in Wicklow, and you have Shorehaven in Tipperary, mm. and it's not a big cohesive no. organisation. Mm. So yeah, there was probably is the same volunteering and services available, but it, there's no branding. Or marketing kind of. They're all individuals. Like I, I'm from, Wic I am from Wicklow. Somebody mentioned the yeah. back of Wicklow, and we have Greystones Cancer Care in my town, and in yeah. Bray they have Purple House, and, and and there's all these tiny centres, and they're doing wonderful things, and they do do the holistic things, yeah. they do do the and yoga and the massage and the chats as much as well. Yeah, and then as well. Like that's a lack of funding though too, that yeah. there isn't an overbody to. Well, it's an work. Irish thing. Can I make a comment and here? Go sorry, just before yeah, I, I, go ahead. The MedEx program as well too that like that's happening in Dublin but in Cork and Limerick and it's an exercise and oncology service that is there for people as well but right. it, uh, so many patients that I come across never hear about these things yes You're not because wrong. it's fragmented yeah. uh, so I was on the board of the Irish Cancer Society and it was so frustrating you know when we'd be fundraising and there's a lot of this volunteer th that those ideas and the modeling on the Macmillan etc and the Irish Cancer Society is trying to deal with both the social and the research side we don't have to but we knew that there were these quite enormous and successful um, fundraising initiatives in all the counties, Galway, Cork, as you say, everywhere themselves. And there's a real element of um, pump, the village pump. And on the one hand, it's the, it's the community. So it's a very Irish thing. And it is parochial. one of parochial, yeah. So we have to look in at ourselves and ask us ourselves how we do this better. We, we do, and actually that feeds back into why we have so many centres of excellence exactly. as well. It's the exact same thing, and exactly. no local politician will ever not want to say. I, I, this how I ended up in the, in the media was I wrote once ever an article. It was supposed to be a one-off article. I wrote it in Sunday Independent, and I even remember the headline because I thought it was going to be oh, the one, and I ended up leaving medicine and everything as in to become a media person. But... But I wrote a thing saying proximity is no substitute for survival, and I wrote an article saying we need to centralise cancer care and we need to take parish pump politics out of it because people will die. And I, I wrote that back in 2008, and the amount of letters that came into my surgery from consultants around the country in what I would almost refer to as cottage hospitals, because some of them nearly were, furious with me telling me to stay in my road I mean it was enormous I did use the word they shouldn't be dabbling I know that was a, a provocative word but that's what you do when you write in the paper um, but but I wrote about that and about we right. well I, I was you, you know I was you know yeah, um, but imagine, nonetheless that was, that was over Healy a decade Ray. ago and that was like, not imagine popular. Jackie Healy Ray saying we're going to close the the hospital not here. a popular you'll have to, you'll have to drive to a local to politician doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do. Yes, do Look, can I just yes. say, what a fantastic panel of people who gave their time, but also their expertise and indeed their experiences to, to talk tonight. I, I have found it incredibly interesting. Orla Shields, Sinead Gleeson, Owen Gill, Kleena O'F... Farrell. Oh, Farrell, it's going to be flat, you know. <laughs> and, and, and Martin Locke, thank you all very much for, for talking and I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I do. Thank you all for coming this evening. A huge amount to take on board. Um, I think if we could do anything, what I have taken is is we need to be more cohesive and bring things together. And yeah, maybe centralise it and, yep. and, and parochialism and cancer are not the not friend of each other. Business. So um, thank you all very much for coming this evening. Thank you.